And I just want to start off by saying this. None of you, none of you are alive in 1010 A.D. None of you will be alive in 3030 A.D. You say, no, you don't know the health products I'm taking. Yeah, no, you will not be alive in 3030 A.D., but we're all alive in 2020 A.D. And I believe this is a significant year. I believe it's a key mark year. In fact, as I was praying and seeking the Lord over it, I kept getting the word that 2020 would be a year of fulfillment. That God would fulfill the prayers, the dreams, the things that he's told us, the things that he's spoken over your life, that he will fulfill them in 2020. I saw traction. I saw movement. I saw the end of striving and worrying and crying out. I saw the order being filled and the package being delivered. That's what I saw. So give yourselves a hand as you see God's glory come as the plans that he has for you and me. Psalms 103 is where we're going to open at today. And as we do this, I just want to prep you a little bit in our Mansfield campus. Today is one of my favorite Sundays of all the year that we're going to have. We do this every Sunday. This is called Vision Sunday. Today's going to be a little different for you. I'm not going to minister a specific word necessarily for you. We're going to go through what God has been doing. We're going to look over that, and then we're going to talk about where God is moving us and you and me as a family and what God is going to do in 2020. Are you with me today? Say yes. Have you found Psalms 103, verse 2? Look at what it says. It says, praise the Lord, O my soul. And forget not all his benefits. Would you turn to the person next to you and say, don't forget what he's done. Come on, tell him, so don't you forget what he's done. Continue reading. He says, who forgives all our sins. Come on, somebody who's had some sins forgiven. And heals all our diseases. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Now, if you're in your 20s, you don't care about that last part. But those of us a little older, I am grateful that he's renewing my youth like the eagles. Come on, somebody, that we will grow, we will not, uh, we will run and not grow weary. We will walk and not faint. This passage opens up with something that as Americans, we don't do real well. And it starts off by saying, praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Sometimes, especially as Americans, We move so fast to the next thing that we don't acknowledge the thing that he's done. So many times we forget about how good God's really been. And he's been good to me. I don't know about you, but he's been good to me. How about you? Has he been good to you? And so this year was a great year in 2019. In fact, when you walked in, you should have been handed your 29 uh, 2019, excuse me, annual review. Would you open that up? Get that in your hand. We're going to go through that for just a moment. If you're uh, on our live stream campus, if you will go ahead, you can find this review on our website. The moment you open up coth.us, at the top you'll find a, a button that says annual review. So 2019 annual review. And today is going to be a day of rejoicing and uh, acknowledgement. Now, if you grew up in a church or you've not been to church in a while, and maybe you went to a church that never told you where the money went, uh, we bring our tithes and offerings before the Lord, and it's the leadership's job of the church to position that properly so that we can accomplish the vision that God's given us. And so I want to take a moment and just kind of go through this, and I want you to open up the inlet, if you will, and you'll see at the top page on your left the financial report, our total income, Church on the Hill, was $1.59 million. Come on, can you give yourselves a hand for being faithful to tithes and offerings? Wow! And that is about a 10% increase from last year, which is magnificent. And what's happened is God's been good to some of us. In fact, if you, would you just give me a show of hands? If God in 2019 did something special for you financially, either you got a raise or a bonus or some breakthrough in some finances, would you just show your hands? Or just throw your hand up, right? Good Lord, look at this right now. Those of you that don't have your hands up, because you're like, dude, none of that happened for me. I want you to grab that person with their hand up and get them to lay their hand on your head and say, give me some of that. <laughs> Ah, Mansfield just started laying hands on everybody. Awesome. <laughs> that is a miracle increase, and I'm so grateful for it. And I'm so grateful for your ability to bring your tithes and offerings for, before the Lord. And I just believe that 1.5 is magnificent. Now, when you look down through where we spent that and how we put our resources, uh, we start number one, you'll see our staff salaries at 39%. And I just, I am so proud of this church. I don't know if you understand this, but we only have about seven or eight people 
people that are full-time. Most of our people on staff are part-time and stipend. And the reason why we have part-time and stipend, because they oversee all the volunteers. In fact, if you volunteer at this church, you serve in any one of our serve teams, you serve as a small group leader, you give yourself to help the movement of the gospel here at Church on the Hill, would you just, would you just stand with me? If you serve on any serve team, whatever it may be, or small group, life, would you just stand right now? Can we give these guys a thank you? This is the team that makes it happen. We love you. Thank you so much for all that you do. Right now, we've got folks serving in the kids' ministry, in the cafe. You've got folks out in the parking lot waving people in. That's really the team that makes this place happen. And that's why we want you to go through the grow track so you can find your place in that. So you're not like, well, how do I get connected? Show up tonight, and we'll show you how, and we'll connect with you. And then the next piece you'll see is that we spent 24% of our uh, income towards our operations. So the mortgages on the facilities, the Mansfield, the Cedar Hill facility, you know, all the uh, electricity, just like you in your life, all the pieces that you have to do uh, to make all those things happen. And then you'll look down, 10% we put in savings. That is awesome. Can I just help you as your pastor? You should be personally putting 10% of your income in savings every month. You say, what? I've never heard that. Well, somebody didn't do you right. Because see, if you'll put 10% of your income in savings, you'll give 10% to the Lord and you live on 80%, I promise you, you will always have everything you need. All your needs will be taken care of. Because here's what happens. None of us realize that there are moments that are coming down the horizon, that are on the horizon, that we don't really, we hadn't planned for financially. And if you put money in savings, for example, this summer, we had multiple air conditioned units. There's 16 air conditioned units on top of this building right here in Cedar Hill. We had multiple air conditioned units go out. Do you remember me standing in front of you in July saying, if you don't give today, we're going to be sweating. And we're going to be sweating all over the place, hallelujah, and handing out little fans so you could survive the service? You know why we didn't do that? Because we had money in savings. We just went and had them fixed. We just spent those thousands of dollars and just had it fixed. Why? Because we're always prepared for whatever the enemy may do, and we're always prepared for whatever God may want us to do, and we can turn on a dime. And so you need to have some money in savings so that if an opportunity shows up, you can say, baby, we got this. Let's go buy that brand new boat. The Lord brought that in front of I'm just kidding. Right <laughs> ah, praise the Lord. All right, if you look down now at the next piece, our community expansion, 9%. The bulk of that community expansion, 9% of our budget, went towards our Mansfield campus. Come on, can we give Mansfield one more hand? Mansfield, we love you. And what we did there, and I just, if you don't know about this, but last year we decided that we wanted to be like Jesus. What Jesus did not do, if you'll go back and study the scriptures, he did not set up a building in Jerusalem and said, now, if you want some of me, come here. That's exactly the opposite of what he did. He went to the people. And so we realized that it was time to begin to expand into places that we didn't necessarily have, uh, you know, uh, a stake in the ground. And we kept hearing the Lord say, Mansfield. And we found this little old building. It was pretty bad off, guys. It was a little church that had, uh, that had really st strived to do great things. And they just kind of come to the end of their race. The facilities was in bad shape. And, uh, and so we bought this little old church. It was uh, about half a million dollars. In fact, the city was working to begin to condemn it. It was under, under those auspices to, to condemn that building. And uh, we bought it just before they condemned it. And then because of, you know, Moffat Construction, we went in and we remodeled that thing and we spent about six hundred thousand dollars to the tune of about 1.1 million dollars the value of that building is more than that and then we asked 40 superhero Christians out of our congregation. We sent 40 missionaries to go help us start that campus, and they've been doing that ever since, and I have been so proud of them. They've been doing outreaches. They've been ministering. It is a beautiful boutique campus, and I'm telling you, I'm so proud of our expansion. People are getting saved. Marriage is being put back together, all because we decided as a church, we're not going to just sit here, and we're not going to just take all the money and make brand new little carpet pieces everywhere and all these little things, that we're going to keep going into the nations of the world, into our areas, and reach people who will never drive over here to Cedar Hill, but they'll right down the corner, they can be ministered to in their own church buildings. So let's give it up one more time for Mansfield. We love you guys. Thank you. And then if you keep following along with me, then we put 10% in missions last year. Now, you got to understand philosophically, uh, as, a, as, a, as a human, as a Christian, a follower of God, uh, Jamie and I take 10% of our income, as the scripture teaches us to do, and we give it to the Lord. Now, the Bible tells us to give it to the Lord, but he, we give to God through his church. And so we brought our 10% in, and Jamie and I actually are now beyond 10%. We give closer to 12 or 13%. And we feel like, as the leaders of the church, that the church itself should give 10%. Percent away, and so not, I'm not talking about our outreaches. I'm not talking about how we help people who are hurting. We're talking about we take ten percent 
and we give it to missionaries and missions. That money will never, if you will, build the buildings. It'll never necessarily uh, get more people to come to our church. Anything. We give a tenth to the things of God in the nations of the world. And we, we support over 19 missionaries. We have missionaries in the toughest places around the world. In, in Iran and Iraq, out there ministering. We have missionaries all throughout South and Central America because of what we give here today. Give yourselves a hand for being faithful to the tithes and offering. Missions. And then we put 5% towards ministry as an outreaches. I love that we have so many beautiful ministries. If you don't know about what we have for you, we have kids ministry. You'll notice that our kids ministry, what we do with our kids ministry is we do not, we do not pastor your children. What we do is we help you pastor your children. We believe as parents, you are their pastor, you are their mentor, you are their head, if you will. And so we come alongside, and so you'll get emails, you'll get little take-homes from your kids, and, and we do that on purpose so you can sit down with your child and say, now what did you learn today at, at Kids on the Hill? Wow, that's awesome. That, you know, we learned this over in the big service, if you will, and you guys can engage, and we do that on purpose. And then you'll notice that we have a great uh, junior high ministry that happens on Sunday mornings. We do it in the first service, this service right here, here in Cedar Hill. We're working all those things for Mansfield. Those are up and coming for Mansfield campus. But right now here in Cedar Hill for junior high. And those kids are getting so touched. I, all the time I hear these reports from our junior high kids. Man, we are, we are hearing from God. We're getting ministered to. And then our youth, our high school age, uh, we meet every Wednesday night. And they are in the schools. They're doing small groups. Just, uh, I think they've got like six or eight small groups just for high schoolers here in this church. And they're magnificent. And then, of course, our young adult ministries. And then we do our young adults. Guys, I'm telling you, we've got the coolest young adults. Uh, Brennan and Gina are heading that up now for us. I love you guys. So proud of you. And they're working with small groups. They're doing activities. They're going to do ski trips. Uh, Brennan's from Colorado. So he said, can I take him on a snow skiing trip this year? I was like, where does the senior pastor sign up for young adult ministry? I'm going. I'm going to go snow skiing with the young people. <laughs> and, so, and, so you, and then what we do in Church on the Hill is small groups for everyone. And so this year in small groups, it's going to be some of the most exciting times. We'll get to that here in just a second. But what I love about this church is, is that we actually are family and we carry one another. And that's what small group life is supposed to look like. And so you'll see we put about 5% of the budget towards that. And then this last year, we split uh, in 2019, 2% went to facility improvements. You can say, I can tell y'all need to spruce up some stuff around here. And we are. In 2020, we're going to spend a little bit more effort here in the Cedar Hill campus. Now that we got the Mansfield up and going, we're going to spend a little bit more more money sprucing some things up we're going to be you know tearing out some carpet we've got some expansion pieces and things like that and i'm so excited about how we gave and spent our money as a church and i'm so proud to give yourselves one more hand for how you how you gave and god was faithful to that but the most important thing in this whole document to me if you'll turn over and you'll look in the top right corner is that we saw over 775 people make decisions for jesus christ come on give yourself a hand for get when we give we're able to help people come to know jesus as their lord and savior and that's a big deal. Now, I don't know about you, but I remember what it was like not to be a Christian. I can remember what it was to not even understand who Christ was. And if you haven't had an experience with Christ, thank you for being here today. We want you to know the love of God. See, how I grew up, my mom and her family had gone through some real tragic things in, in, in their family. And so my grandmother kind of turned away from God. And, and so the kids no longer went to church anymore. So by the time I came around, we didn't talk about God. I didn't know God. I didn't know what church was. But one day, single mom raising me. Pop hadn't come in our life yet. One day this man came around. And he was, he was driving in one of these little things. You know, uh, before there were SUVs, they, they had these things called station wagons. This man pulled up, and we were kind of like in a sandlot type of environment. A bunch of my little friends, we were out playing uh, baseball, you know, in the little lot that didn't have a house built on it yet. And this guy walked up, and he goes, hey, kids, y'all want some candy? Come here, I want to talk to you. Well, I grew up pretty much in, in the hood, so I was like, dude, that's a child molester. Y'all better not walk over there. Y'all going to get taken. And he's got that big old machine station wagon thing for a reason. And so they all ran over there and got candy, and I just kind of watched for a little bit. And, and finally, I realized, well, they didn't die. And so, and he didn't take them. So I kind of moseyed on over and I was kind of getting some candy. And, and uh, he said, now, boys and girls, I want you to know that I want you to know who Jesus is. We're doing this so that you can know who Jesus is. And, and so, you know me, I'm always the talker. And so I was like, who the blank is Jesus? He said, son, Jesus is the Savior of the world. The Savior of what world? He said, look, I want you to come to church with me and I'll tell you more about it. You'll learn more about it. Church, what the blank is church? He said, son, just, just come, all right, just come. And he said, now next week, next Sunday, we're going to send a bus around, and y'all get on the bus, and we're going to go to Sunday school. 
And so I said, uh, I said, what time are you coming? He said, we're going to come like 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. On a Sunday, have you lost your ever-living mind? I said, I won't, I'm not going to do that. They parked that bus right out in front of our house. <laughs> our house. And you remember those old church buses? Blah, 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 blah. The brakes. <laughs> and so I looked out the window that morning. And, man, I'm not going with them. I noticed about ten little girls. That was all. No dudes were going or nothing. And they all got on the bus. And next week, same thing, right from my house. This time it was like 15 or 20. But, it was, again, it was all girls. And the third week I looked out, there's about 30. And I realized it's all girls. I'm going to church, man. What's, <laughs> this, this is like shooting fish in a barrel. This is great. And for the first time, I heard the gospel. And that little sweet Sunday school lady, she was so sweet and so kind. If you hadn't heard my story, she started off telling about knowing the ark. And she said, boys and girls, years ago, the world had become wicked. And God, he decided he was going to change it all. And so he talked to a man named Noah, and she put this little, they had these little things called felt boards. I know y'all don't know what that is. Y'all went to Sunday school back in the day. (laughs) And she stuck this little figure on this little felt board, and then she put this little boat, and she said, God put Noah in the boat, and then the rains came down, and the floods came up, and all the people of the earth drowned a terrible death. And I'm just sitting back there like, whoa. And she said, and boys and girls, that ark is like Jesus. See today, boys and girls, If you don't accept Jesus, you're going to have a terrible death one day. But she started real sweet and kind, but then she shifted. She said, that ark is like like Jesus, boys and girls. And if you don't accept Jesus, when you die, you're going to go to hell, boys and girls. And hell will be a place where the demons beat you and beat you all night long. And you'll cry, oh, mommy, but there'll be no mommies. No, only demons to destroy you day in and day out. Now, boys and girls, how many of you would like to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? I was like... Little sweet Church of Christ Sunday school. So she took me to the pastor. She said, Pastor, this young man wants Jesus in his life. And he said, Son, you want Jesus coming to your life? I said, Sir, I don't know anything about blanking Jesus, but I know this. I don't want to go to the place where the demons beat you all night long. He said, Close enough. Let's go. He took me in the back. They water baptized me. Friend, when I came out of that water, something has shifted. God was real to me. God had changed my life. Me, me, Pop, me, me were dating, and we, got, we all got saved together, and it shifted every... I remember what it was like to go to church and not understand what these people were doing. I can remember feeling like so left out of the circle. I can remember what it was like to learn God and experience God. Friend, when we see 775 people come to know Jesus, we are doing his work. Give yourselves a hand one more time. Thank you so much for being a part of that with us. And I don't ever want to be the same. If you look over, also you'll notice that we had over almost 600 people in small group life with us. Come on, give yourselves a hand. If you're, if you're connected to a small group, throw your hand up. Let me just see. Look at these amazing folks. So um, a little over, uh, almost half of our church are in small group life. Now, if you come to this church, you're going to hear me talk about small group life for the rest of your existence. You say, oh my God, I wish he'd shut up. I will not. I will not because we were not made to go this thing alone. You were not made to try to figure out how to walk with Jesus alone. Do you know God himself is not alone? He's in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're never alone. Do you understand that? Do you understand when Jesus came to the earth, he had 12 disciples that he invested his life in the New Testament church. The New Testament church was in small group life. They met in homes together. How foolish of us to think that because we have a Bible app, because we're so busy doing all these other things, we don't really have time to have good Christian relationships and friendship. No, that's silly. We need accountability. We need somebody that's got our back. We need somebody that knows that we've been sick. You can't expect the pastors and the leadership to know all that. You need Christian friends. You need someone who's got your back. Say, baby, I got you. You ain't not going to do that. We are not going to go through this by ourselves. You need someone and a group of people who loves you, and we're walking it out together. We call that small groups. Are you with me? Say yes. Now, I know some of you are a little insecure, like maybe you've gone through something back in the day. You're not really relational. You're not that good at relations. You don't know how to start relationships. And so that can be a little intimidating. So what we've done in 2020 is we've given you the opportunity. You ready? We've given you the opportunity to shop. To shop the relationships in this church. In fact, I call it our dating app. Yeah, I call it our dating app. And what you can do is you can go to online with us. You can go to our website. You say, man, I'm kind of interested in small group. I don't really know. You go, and I'll show you how to do it. You can go, you can go, to, go to our website, coth.us. You can click it on I think we're going to give it to you now. Are we playing that, guys? Let's go.
site. And then what will happen is you go over and you see the drop down on connect, small groups. It will give you the small group page piece. And you can go and you can click on find a group. And then what it will do is it will give you all the different groups. you got the Mansfield campus. There you go. you got, you got the, small, the Cedar Hill campus. And look at all these amazing people that you can go. You can go and you can be a, you can be a little snooper on their life. And you say, well, man. So see, if you're looking for a good Asian group, there you go. There's the best looking <laughs> <laughs> and you can, and what you can do is just say, man, I like what they had to write about. Sounds like they're kind of like me. It sounds like they, they are out in the, eight, you know, the season of life that we're in. That might fit us. And you can, you can enter in your information. And all it is is your name and an uh, email address. And then they'll get that. And then they can email you back. And you can say, hey, I just wanted to come check out, maybe meet you at church or something like that. Maybe have a cup of coffee. Uh, you know, pastor keeps pushing us to have good Christian friends and have some accountability in our life, people that love us. I just want to check out and see if that works. Now, the beauty of a dating app is... more dating. There's some other folks on that side. I want to give you the freedom to find relationships that work for you. And I know how difficult it is to establish relationships. And what we've been working on with our small groups for you this year is you really want to connect because our small groups this year are going to be going through uh, marriage seminars. They're going to be going through some marriage training to help strengthen our marriage. In our small groups, we're going to be doing some teachings on and going through some videos on how to raise our kids in a godly way. We're going to be going through how to get out of some of our financial difficulties that we're having. We're going to go, we're going to get some expert teachers and we're going to go through video series in some of our small groups. You want to connect this year because this year is going to be a year of growth. Turn to that person next to you and say, I'm going to grow this year. Tell them that. Say, I'm going to grow this year like I've never grown before. And then if you look at the bottom of our little piece here, you'll see our community outreach, our community outreaches. And this last year, we were so involved in our community, and I just want to point that out to you. Look in the bottom right. You see, we had over 5,000 people at our Miracle Weekend in Cedar Hill. Come on, give the Lord a hand for that. And then we did our block party both in Mansfield and in Cedar Hill. In Cedar Hill, we had 1,300 people. We had a couple hundred folks in Mansfield. I was so proud of our Mansfield people because we had never done it before. And we put out all these inflatables, and all the neighbors came walking over like, can we, can we do this? Is this like, is it free? Like, does it cost anything? And all of our Mansfield leaders were just loving on folks and just inviting them over to services and stuff like that. It was magnificent. And then we did 54 outreaches. 54 outreaches. We had small groups doing block parties. We had, we had folks, some of you guys went with me to, to uh, we, we did the, you know, uh, the YMCA there in Oak Cliff, and we just loved on the families during Christmas, and, and we did all types, we did 54 outreaches. If you served on an outreach of any type, whether it was with, with your small group, or whether you helped us with Miracle Weekend, or the block party, would you just lift your hand right there? I want you to see all the people who served. Listen, your hand will be up next year. Give these guys a hand. Thank you for serving with us, helping us reach people. I'm so proud, my goodness. And so I thought for just a moment, I'd like to show you just a little recap video of kind of what it looked like in 2019 of all the outreaches that we did, all the pieces that we did. I want, hopefully you can see your face in some of these. I want you to get a little imagery, especially if you're new to us, on what type of church we are and how we love our community. So we want to play that video for you right now.
and now it's gone. So let's look a little bit into 2020. I want to cast a little bit of vision for your life and for our church. If you look on the back of this little piece that we handed you, or those of you that are watching on live stream, you can kind of click to the next piece of it. And you'll see that we have a clear vision for 2019. The first thing that I have in my heart that God spoke to us is that every one of you become a minister. Every one of you become a minister. I need to help you break through in your mind that all you are is an attender to a church service. God saved your life. God has done something great inside of you. You can help somebody else. If you were with us in our cyber service, our online service, I told the story about Kwame Brown and Michael Jordan. I told the story how Kwame Brown was fresh out of high school and Michael Jordan on his brand new expansion team drafted Kwame Brown right out of high school as a first round draft pick. No one had ever done that before. No one had ever come right out of high school as a first round draft pick. This guy was probably, they were expecting him to be as, as great as any player who had ever played. And in his engagement with Michael Jordan, he became a little arrogant. And Michael Jordan set out to teach him a lesson because Michael was going to mentor him. And in that teaching of a lesson, Michael used those old school taxes to tell him, you're an idiot. You're a blanker blanker. And he literally tore that man down. And Kwame Brown never became the great man he was supposed to be in the NBA. He played. He had okay seasons. But he never became the great man he was supposed to be. Because one person who had the ability to make him great used the wrong tactics and actually destroyed him. I want you to understand something. Every one of us, there's somebody in our life that God would have us minister to to build them up. There's somebody you work with. There's a kid down the street. There's somebody in our lives that we need to minister to, that we need to build up. We need to encourage. I'm here today because a little man went around in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the neighborhoods asking kids to go to Sunday school. Do you know that they shut that program down? after four or five weeks and didn't go pick up kids anymore to go to Sunday school because they said it wasn't worth the money. There weren't enough kids coming and their parents weren't coming and so they weren't getting any tithe money from it. So it was costing us more money than it was worth to win these kids to Jesus. Thank God that in that four or five week period, that little window that Jesus Christ got my attention and I was able to be, and the thousands and tens of thousands who've come to Jesus because of that little guy's effort going around on a Saturday asking kids to go to Sunday school. You are called to minister to others. Would you receive that right now and just say yes in Jesus' name? Amen. Here's the second piece on the vision I want us to understand as a church is that we want to see over a thousand souls come into the kingdom. Do you realize that if each and every one of us affected one person for Jesus, if every person who calls themselves a Christian just once a year brought one person into a relationship with Jesus Christ, that the statistics are, that the, based on the amount of Christians that are, live in the world, that the statistics are that between, between two and a half to four years, we could win the entire world to Jesus. So the object and the, pro, the object of our focus should less be about how much money we make and how bigger houses that we're building, but it should be more about infl influencing others to know the truth about who Jesus is. And if we would all just minister to somebody, we could change the world. And we'd like to see that happen in Church on the Hill. Here's the next vision that we have, peace for, that we have for every one of us as a church, and that is that we would graduate over 500 people this year through our grow track. Some of you tonight, you're going to come in Jesus' name, every one of you who haven't been through. And the reason that is is because it's kind of our funnel. If you'll kind of, kind of get outside of the standing on the edges looking in and get in with us, then you can get in the vision where we can change the world together. And in the grow track, this is where you'll find purpose. And our grow track is where we're going to find freedom together. It's in the grow track that we show you what we are and how to connect and find your place. We take you through, we take you through these amazing moments of discovering your personality style, your spiritual giftings. You don't even know you have spiritual giftings. We do this assessment to help you figure that out. Friend, I'm telling you, this is the place. You come to, people come to me all the time. I love this church, so how do I connect? It starts at the Grow Track. And so this Sunday night here in Cedar Hill and in the month of February in Mansfield on Wednesday night. So you have some options there. And then if you, and you can go to our website at coth.us backslash grow dash track right now. And you can register right from your smartphone, right where you're sitting, right here, right now. So it's time, baby. Let's do something with our life. Let's not, let's, if we're going to make a New Year's resolution, let's make one to get closer to God and be, and be part of the, the vision of moving people closer to Jesus with Church on the Hill. And here's the next piece, and that is we're believing that we'll see 100 people minister on a short-term mission trip with us this year. Come on. I'm telling you right now, I am your pastor today because I was 14 years old, went on a mission 
missions trip, and I was sitting there, and I had my little brand-new Nike shoes on. Y'all don't know this because you're too young, but I had these pair of Jabot pants that were my favorite Jabots. I had my polo shirt on on a missions trip, and then them little orphans started getting dirt on my polo shirt. And I was like, no, sir. And then I realized they don't have kids. They don't have parents. They don't have food. And I went, what is life all about? I'm sitting here trying to be Mac Daddy, and these kids are dying overseas, and it shifted me. I'm a pastor instead of a businessman today because of that trip. Something shifted in me. The value of my worldview shifted from what it's not all about me. It's about what God wants to do in the earth. And I became a part of his team to change the world. And so if you go on a short-term missions trip, well, three weeks ago, one of the most precious single moms in our church came up to me after service crying. She said, you were preaching. I didn't even know what you were preaching about. And God began to tell me to go on a short-term missions trip with Church on the Hill. Do you think that's his will? I was like, yes, I do. I didn't even have this printed yet. I was like, this is because I've been working on it. I was like, oh, my goodness. God, God, you're answering my prayer. And she said, but I didn't, how am I going to do that? I, how am I going to get the money? How am I, gonna? I said, God will help you. He'll help all of us. You go on a short-term mission trip, it'll change your life forever. A chunk of us are going to one day L.A. this year. In L.A., great Christians are gathering to spend a week going through the streets of L.A., loving on kids, loving on individuals, and then culminating into a giant moment in a big stadium where we're going to simulcast it around the world, all that God had done that week and all the miracles that are happening. We're calling that a mission trip, and we're going to go. A bunch of our staff are going to go, and I would tell you, sign up for that. You want to know more information about a short-term mission trip? Go in our lobby, and they'll answer questions for you there. And then the next piece is we want to third, uh, expand our influence to a third campus. We want to expand our influence to a third campus. You, for those of you that were in this service this morning, you got to meet uh, Pastor Sean and es Esme, uh, Esmeralda. They opened up our service in prayer, and uh, they are in stage one, the first stage of us expanding a, th a third campus. We have identified the space between SMU and Bishop Arts. We feel like God's pointing that out, and we feel like God wants to put a campus there. And Sean and Esme, they're going to be leading that up, and so they're in stage one. They're in the stage just gathering people people who are interested in maybe being like missionaries and going into that space. Maybe you're from that area and you're like, we got to do something for this area of the Metroplex. They're, gonna, they're starting to gather people. We're going to start putting teams together, worship teams and kids ministry teams. We're going to start going out with street witnessing and just meeting folks around SMU's campus, down through Bishop Arts, all through the area, just seeing where God would have us land. And if you're interested in that, Sean, raise your hand right here on the front row. Come talk to Sean after service because we're believing that we're going to do that this year and we'll take as long as we need to take because God's going to do it because because it's his dream, not ours. Are you with me? Say yes. All right, now this last one, we're going to radically engage the third space. Radically engage the third space. Now, I'm going to blow some of you older people's mind for a moment, not because you're older, just simply because you've done church so long in a certain way that you're not even going to like, like I don't even know if God can be in what he's about to say. But I, but I, I want to tell you what the Lord's been speaking to us as a leadership team, as, as our lead team and eldership. We see clearly that God's trying to do something. I'm using the term third space to represent that digital space, social media, YouTube, these places that now an entire generation on the planet spend more time in third space than they do in first space. More time. In fact, no one has ever come in the last 12 months probably to this church, to this service, without first checking us out in third space. Without first going on the website, without first kind of following us on social media to see if we're crazy. You know, where are the snakes at? Are they going to bring the snakes out? You know, that dude is kind of, that preacher guy, he's kind of silly. They, 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 none of you did that. You first went into that space and checked it out. In fact, I want to show you in Scripture God's plan for this. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. This is Jesus right before he ascends. He's already died went down into the bowels of hell, destroyed, sick, overcame sickness in the grave and death, resurrected. And for the last 40 days, at this point in Scripture, in Mark chapter 16, he's been, a, he's been showing up. He's just been showing up to over 400 people. And Mark records this moment as his last moment of speaking with the 11 disciples. He shows up, and he shows up where they're at, and they're like, whoa, there he is again. And he begins to speak to them, and at the end of this, he actually, he actually ascends into heaven. And so let's read what would you would think would be one of his most important things he could ever tell you right before he begins to 
go into heaven, he gives them a final word. And this is in Mark chapter 15, chapter 16, verse 15. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. Verse 19. And after the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out. The disciples went out and preached everywhere. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word which by signs or with through signs that accompanied it. Jesus actually worked with them when they obeyed him. And we see here, first the thing he tells us in verse 15 is go into all the world. Go into all the world. Friend, as followers of Jesus, he's given us a command to go into all the world. Back in the day, for us, we thought, okay, well, then that's it. We've got we, we, we to go to Africa. Uh, we, what we would do is we'd go out street witnessing every Friday and Saturday night. We'd stand out in front of the clubs, and they're in there. And we're standing there. Do you, you, you want to know Jesus? And they're all like, nah, we're good. We'd go out and do all these street witnesses because we're going into all the world. Can I tell you what God has done supernaturally? God has put all the world in one place now. Just about everyone on the planet is now in what I'm calling third space. They're in some type of social media grouping. They're they're either on Instagram or Facebook or YouTube. Friend, do you realize back in the day the only people who could promote themselves or their agenda were people who could get in with the media, that could be on TV, that could be on radio. But God has done something supernatural where every one of you, every one of us, can minister to people who are sitting in third space with nothing else to do. They will follow you. They will listen to you. I'm I'm telling you, this is the time to go into that space. And what's happened is the Christians and everybody, all we're doing is using that third space to promote stuff. We're just marketing ourselves. God didn't want us to market. He wants us to go in there and preach the good news and love on hurting people and show them that we care about them. And and, and In fact, can I just share this with you? I have a friend here today who's, who's an amazing man of God. This man of God started this Facebook group. Ended up with over, I think it was over 50,000 people in this Facebook group that he, that he did. And, and it was based on some, you know, some connectivity of the, some things that people have been through. And, and, and it had a similar, you know, you know a, a little profile piece. And he said, he won, he's so excited because he was able to minister to people. He said, but then guess what the Christians started doing? They started using that space to argue doctrine. They started using that space to talk about politics. And all the people who were hurting just kind of started tuning out. He said they destroyed 50,000. I got 50,000. When do you get to preach to 50,000 people? 50,000. Some of you got a couple hundred people following you. That, that, that minister to them. Stop comparing yourself with them. Stop taking pictures of your food and say, isn't that sexy? And say, hey, listen, there is food that you know not of. There is life that you don't have yet that you can have. Let us go into this space and begin to minister the love and the truth of Jesus Christ. If Jesus was on the planet right now and he had 12 disciples, I'm telling you what, he'd be, they'd be starting YouTube channels right now. I'll tell you what they would be doing. They would be on social media to proclaiming the good news that you don't have to die, you don't have to be destroyed, but you can live life with God. And that depression that you're going through doesn't have to destroy you, but it can actually, you can actually be free from it because Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. There's a young man in our church. He approached me a couple weeks ago. And he said, Pastor, since I was a little boy, his whole family loves young people. They, they, their whole family. I mean, mom, dad, brother, sister, all of them love young people. And this young man, I think he's about 16 years old, and, and, he, uh, and he came to me. He said, you know, he had big tears in his eyes. He said, I have been believing to help kids my whole life, but I've never really had influence. I'm a homeschooler. You know, I don't really have a lot of influence. He said, but then I got, I got connected with TikTok, and I opened an account. He said, and, I, and so a lot of it, I was just me gaming, like, ah, I just beat him, ha, ha, ha. And people were like, oh, yeah, great. He said, I had a few followers. He said, the other day, my friend and I went to this concert. And we were standing in line. It was like 5,000 people waiting for them to open the doors. He said, I had this thought. I'm going to jump up on this wall where everybody can see me. He said, he jumped up on the wall, and his friend started videoing him. And he started saying, hey, everybody, when I say chicken, you say nugget, chicken. Everybody's like, nugget? 
I said, come on, you can do it. Well, I say chicken, you say nugget, chicken. And by the end of it, everybody's like, nugget, chicken, nugget. I mean, the whole place, 5,000 people. His friend's recording it. They post it. It goes viral. It goes viral. Just a homeschool kid in our church. Good kid who cries out to God, I just want to help other kids. Immediately, he had 16,000 followers. As he's on his social media, kids start saying, hey, I think I'm going to kill myself. And he starts, you don't have to kill yourself. You can have hope. He's got 10-year-olds. He's got 12-year-olds, 16-year-olds saying, hey, can you help me through what I'm going through? Because I don't know how to talk to my mom and dad. Can you help me? Friend, can I tell you something? It is time to be the church, to go into that space. He said, go into all the world. We have an easy world. He's made it so, and I believe, the reason why I believe this is so important, because I believe it's wrapping up. I believe it's wrapping up. I believe the end is near. And I believe, as the scripture tells us, that he will have it preached to every tongue and tribe will hear the gospel. And I believe that we, the church, not the preacher dude, see, I don't need millions following me. What I need is you ministering to 10,000, and you ministering to 5,000, and you ministering to 200, and you ministering. We'll change the world together. I'm so frustrated with all of these Christian celebrities who want everybody to follow them. I don't want them to follow me. I want them to follow you. I want them to follow Christ, first and foremost, and I want you to disciple them through the third space. You and I can do this together. We can change the world. You can, you can wake up every morning and help someone and say, listen, look what I read today. Look what I overcame today. You don't have to do that. You can be like this. God changed me. He can change you because we all have a story and we all have a testimony, but we've got to go into the world. We've got to preach it. Listen, do you understand? A few years ago, I will just give you a quick testimony. Justin Bieber, who had grown up in the church, who would went away from God, Justin Bieber is in a terrible situation. He's in and up, in and out of jail. He's got a crazy drug issue. He's finding himself in rehab. And a group of young, cool, hip pastors started following him on social media. Justin would post something. They would post back to it. They would reply to it. Dude, that's awesome. I want you to know we're praying for you. He would say something, they'd start responding back to it. It got his attention. It, it, he's like, whoa, who are these people? For you know what? They got to talking back and forth so much, you know, direct messaging each other, that Justin wanted to meet them. Before you know that, and I may get some of the details not exactly accurate, but this, this is pretty much the storyline. Before you know that, they, they were sitting in the green room with him before one of the concerts. And when he got in trouble, and this kind of difficulty, he called on them. And this one particular pastor, Carl Lentz, Carl Lentz took him into his home, out of rehab. When people found out that Carl Lentz had Justin Bieber in his home for a couple weeks, ministering to him, they began knocking on the door. He said, we had to leave my house and go hide out somewhere where Carl ministered to him and ministered to him. Do you know that Justin Bieber is considered the number one social influence in the world right now? He's about to come out with a documentary about how Jesus changed his life, how he almost got destroyed through all of this stuff. He canceled his tour in that moment as he got right with God. Friend, because one pastor, a group of little young pastors, started responding in third space to the needs of hurting people. Come on, are you with me? Say yes. This is our finest hour. I'm telling you, I knew I was going to blow some of your minds. Some of you are looking at me like, oh my God. This is our finest hour to see the hurting minister to. If I told you, that I could put 7 billion people in one place in a stadium and there would be millions of microphones and you could go grab one and speak to a whole section of people by yourself if you wanted to. Would you not take advantage of that? Sure you would. Well, that's exactly what has happened with social media, YouTube, website, this whole third space, this digital space. And it's time for us to arise. I'm telling you something. If we don't, our young people will. Our young people are going to change. Listen, our young people, we've been talking with our young people and our young adults. They get it. They say, Pastor, let's do it. Let's change the world one hurting soul at a time. Let's stop using the digital space to promote our little marketing thing, and let's get in there and start loving, hurting people and responding to their needs and showing them the truth of the gospel. And he says, and he told them to preach. And then look what it says happened. As they went out, as they did that, as they were obedient to that, it says, and then the Lord worked with them. Have you ever felt like God wasn't working with you? That's probably because you were working the wrong job. If you want God to work with you, do the job that he's told us to do, and that is to go into all the world and preach the gospel, to show the truth of the gospel to the hurting people, to show them the love of Jesus Christ. When you and I begin to do what he told us to do, he works with us, and then guess what it says? And signs and wonders. It's a miracle that that young man in our church 
He has, that, that thing has now had multiple many, millions of views. Now, when I say chicken, you say nugget. 16, he's preaching to more people every week than I am. 16-year-old. Loving more people and helping them know the gospel more than I am. Why? That's crazy. That's supernatural. It is supernatural. Because when you and I go into that world, go into that space, it says, and Jesus worked with them. He will work with you. It'll be crazy. It'll be supernatural what he does. You'll be testifying, Pastor. You're not going to believe. I, I, I just, I, I, I was engaging with this person on Facebook. They were about to kill themselves. They're about to do this. They're about to do that. I prayed with them on Facebook back and forth. I haven't even met them. And they flew into Dallas to have lunch with me. It's unbelievable, Pastor. I, I had to take, take off from work to go, go meet them at lunch. I laid my hands on them. And they sat there and wept. And they'll never be the same. Never be the same. They're trying to figure out how to move their whole family to Dallas now. Because of this engagement of me ministering. God will work with us when we go into all the world. He will do supernatural things. I want you to experience the supernatural power of God at work in your life. See, our jobs, what we do for an income source, those are all means to an end. The means to an end is that the whole world would know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. That's why we're a part of this. You can tell from me as a pastor, my greatest joy is to see you become a minister to others, to love others. That's your heart. That's or you wouldn't come to this church. We're a missional church, and we want to see people know Jesus. And I know that that's what happened to you. Someone helped you get to know Jesus, and we're going to help others get to know Jesus.